So, fantastic. I'm really glad that we can move right into this session, which I think really segues perfectly out of the last. Um, my name is Randolph Ray. Uh, I'm a senior specialist, specialist in DDR and security transitions at FBA, the Swedish Agency for Peace, Security, and Development. That is a mouthful. Um, and I'm really uh, honored to be invited here by Siobhan, Cato, the MIAC team, UNIDIR, uh, to facilitate this uh, session on community rece receptivity to return, uh, justice and accountability. Um, now I'll say right up front, you know, as moderator, there's always a risk to putting a microphone in my hand and giving me a captive audience uh, because I'm likely to just vent about all the issues that I want to talk about. Uh, but I think quite strategically, you've placed me in my afternoon jet, in jet lag induced slump. Uh, so I think you'll, you'll mitigate my worser impulses. Uh, and I'll try to keep my own remarks quite brief here. Um, I think it's been evident by the discussions both yesterday and so far today, there's really been an explosion of interest I find in the last few years around these topics uh, of exit from armed groups, but also especially in the specific issues around justice and accountability. Um, and you know, with that explosion of interest, I think there's been a corresponding kind of proliferation of concepts frameworks, terminology, acronyms uh, that aren't always uh, 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 in agreement, shall we say. I think we've spent a, a, a fair bit of the last few years arguing about uh, specific language, terms, ideas. But I am starting to get the sense, and I really feel that this workshop so far is indi indicative um, that we're kind of turning a corner and coming to the beginning of a consolidation phase, where we're hearing repeatedly calls to go beyond the acronyms and to focus on the specific substance. Um, I think this is really hard work. I think this is incredibly difficult work and it takes a long time, it's slow moving. Um, and you know, to try to lend perspective on this, I often remind myself of some of what I think are the important historical lessons, especially as it pertains to justice and accountability. Um, and I look often towards uh, the long tradition over the last century of building consensus in the international community at national levels, leg leg legislatures, in uh, institutions at all levels around issues around accountability for war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, genocide, other serious crimes. Um, and I think it's a useful reminder that this took a century to develop into the framework we have today, a quite sophisticated framework. Um, so I think it's, we have to temper our, our, the imperatives and enthusiasm we have for uh, creating uh, new frameworks and approaches today in the context often of uh, terrorist designated armed groups uh, with uh, a realization that this is not going to be solved today, tomorrow, or maybe even this decade. It's going to be an ongoing and iterative process. Um, so I think there's no shortcuts here. But I will say, as we kind of, if, I, if, if I'm to keep with my kind of celestial explosion and then consolidation uh, metaphor, that as we move towards consolidation, there's maybe a few centers of gravity or competing imperatives, which I see, which pull us in different directions and which we're grappling with. I mean, some of these are about legal frameworks, again, at different levels, international, state level, regional, subnational. Um, some of these issues are maybe more strictly political, about regional power dynamics, local power dynamics. Um, and some of them are really about the concrete operational concerns, about how will we actually implement some of these uh, approaches, imperatives, uh, ideas that we have about how to, how to support uh, processes related, related to community rep receptivity, justice, and accountability. Um, I have no clear answers, but I'm going to give my distinguished panelists here an opportunity uh, to come with some interventions will help, that will help us to navigate and understand uh, these different kind of competing uh, imperatives. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll round up and I'll pass the floor to, to Ulrich Gams here, please. Thank you. Thank you, Randolph. And thanks, Shaban, for and everybody at the MEAC team for having me here. So I'll try to... Um, connect some of uh, what is in the MEAC research, what we've heard, 
uh, about uh, community receptivity uh, to the UN's uh, frameworks uh, regarding accountability and uh, justice, uh, while at the same time staying away from uh, from acronyms and <laughs> and uh, big uh, concepts and trying to be very uh, concrete. Now. <clears throat> In the Lake uh, Chad uh, Basin, uh, Northeast Nigeria uh, particularly, um, I think you've done all these calls asking about how people uh, would uh, relate to the return of uh, Fatima and uh, Usman uh, to their village. And we are told that Fatima and Usman, uh, all that is known about them is that uh, they have been away uh, for a year uh, with uh, Boko Haram and then they have been one year in detention, and now uh, they would uh, like to return to their, uh, to their village. And I think what's important when we talk about uh, accountability is, and about the UN's uh, frameworks for accountability, is to say that we're not talking about Fatima and Usman. When we talk about accountability, we are talking about people who have uh, committed uh, serious acts of violence against a uh, civilian, primarily a civilian uh, population, so who have uh, killed and maimed and uh, raped and uh, abducted uh, and so forth. So, of course, there is in many uh, counterterrorism contexts uh, a problem, uh, that is that uh, it is the Fatimas and Usmans who are being held accountable and uh, not uh, those uh, who have uh, killed and maimed, but, but that is not what uh, the uh, frameworks uh, that the UN uh, promotes uh, envisage. Now, wh why is accountability, or why could accountability uh, be important uh, and meaningful for community receptivity? Uh, one element, and I think that is the element that is maybe uh, in the forefront in the questions that you have asked, is uh, the question, do uh, community members uh, feel that uh, somebody needs to be punished? Does there have to be a, an element of retribution? Does there have to be an element of satisfaction for the victims so that they, and only if there is that element of satisfaction, they will accept uh, people back? And that is uh, certainly one uh, important element, but I think there are other elements too. And a second element is the security element. So criminal justice has uh, that uh, function of taking, uh, distinguishing between those who have committed serious acts of violence against uh, <coughs> civilians and those who haven't, and of uh, taking those uh, who have out of uh, circulation, let's say, and uh, locking them up uh, so that they do not uh, harm. And so for the community's demands uh, for security, I think uh, criminal justice can play a, a decisive role. Another factor is, uh, and that is very evident in the journey to extremism research, is that one of the circumstances conducive, as, as the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy would say, uh, to a recruitment by violent extremist groups is that state failure to provide basic services. And, and one of the basic services that uh, states, uh, in many of these circumstances that we're talking about, fail to provide is, uh, is justice. Justice as a a basic service that uh, governments are supposed uh, to provide. And so I think that in a uh, medium and long-term perspective, it is essential uh, for uh, governments to, again, provide that basic service of uh, justice if they want to um, change that uh, context that is conducive to recruitment by violent extremist groups. Now, for there's a number of challenges uh, to this um, <coughs> function of uh, justice. One is the, the slowness and the remoteness of uh, justice. Uh, there is the fact we already mentioned that punishment often goes for membership and association and not for the harm actually inflicted. And of course, uh, there is a very difficult uh, topic and that is the impunity of state actors, particularly in counterterrorism contexts. Uh, we have that uh, the, the spotlight of justice is uh, only uh, put on one side uh, to the uh, conflict. In the Lake Chad Basin, but I think also in other contexts, there is now this idea that some of these challenges um, can be addressed uh, by a focus on traditional customary law uh, justice uh, mechanisms, and that 
uh, that is a form of justice that is, is closer uh, to the communities, that is more meaningful to them, uh, that they can uh, relate to, and uh, that it speaks language that they understand, and that it also is not only uh, focused or maybe not at all on retribution, on punishment, but actually on uh, a restorative uh, approach and that and on remedying some of the harm suffered uh, by the victims. And uh, I think these advantages of traditional justice are very obvious, but we have to also uh, keep in mind some of the lessons learned I've, at lunch. Uh, somebody was uh, speaking about how the lessons learned from uh, the research that was done into the LRA uh, conflict can still be relevant today. And I think one of the very interesting research that was done uh, post-LRA uh, was this focus on the uh, Acholi um, traditional justice system and how that uh, can help uh, moving forward, but also on its um, shortcomings, and particularly when it comes to uh, the rights of, of women and of uh, children, and uh, <clears throat> how uh, women did not feel that their need for justice was really met by these uh, traditional uh, mechanisms, and <clears throat> how they often the, the focus would not be on the perpetrator, uh, but on the cleansing of the victim. And <clears throat> so this is clearly a risk, and I know I'm uh, supposed to stop, uh, so let me end uh, by saying that in the, when I was in, in Maiduguri uh, recently, I had the benefit of a meeting with uh, one of the persons who are doing this research into traditional justice mechanisms. And she was saying, well, and uh, then the, the, the woman comes back to the village, and, uh, and uh, one of the decisions that needs to be made is which man she belongs to because she has had one uh, husband in the bush and or in the Sambisa forest and another one in the village, and now the traditional leader needs to decide which man uh, the woman belongs to. And that kind of uh, reminded me of, of that uh, research that was done. So I'll stop uh, here. Thank you so much. Uh, fantastic, Ulrich. Thanks so much for, for grappling with a number of these difficult issues. We're going to pick up on so much of this during the the, uh, the sessions afterwards, but I wanted to just highlight one key thing you said at the at the at the top of your your remarks that grabbed my attention. Of course, that the UN frameworks are not intended uh, to to capture uh, the Fatimas and the Usmans, people who are simply members of groups or perceived to be members of groups, but are are meant to be attached to specific acts. Uh, but nonetheless, that we see that due to the the varying interpretations. The, the, the proliferation of, again, ideas, concepts, frameworks, approaches, uh, it can be that uh, we see that the, this is pursued in many settings like the Lake Chad Basin. Um, next, I believe we have a video message um, from uh, Dr. Rebecca Littman, um, and I'll hand it over. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Rebecca Lippmann. I'm an assistant professor of psychology at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, I can't be with you in person today, so I'm gonna really briefly talk to you about some of my research on community receptivity to return in Northeast Nigeria. So I've been working with the MIAC project and with some other organizations on this question of how people in Northeast Nigeria view reintegration, whether they're receptive to uh, former affiliates coming back to their communities. I started doing this work around 2017, 2018, when a uh, large scale return had not happened yet. And at the time there was this idea that communities would be very resistant, understandably, to former Boko Haram affiliates coming back home. Um, but actually, what I found in the work that my colleagues and I have done over the past five or so years is that receptivity to return is actually very high. So we asked people in 2018 to tell us whether they would be willing to accept a male who had been with Boko Haram and a female who had been with Boko Haram uh, back into their communities. And about 55% of people said that they would accept a male former affiliate back, and about 75% of people would accept a woman who had been abducted into Boko Haram back into their community. But importantly, we also asked people, would you accept a male affiliate, a female affiliate, if 
they're repentant and they're willing to swear on the Quran that they're really repentant in front of the community. And here we found that receptivity to return really increased, particularly when it came to receptivity to a male fighter returning to one's community. And this isn't just the results from one survey. We've asked similar questions in the MIAC project, and we found that about over two thirds <coughs> of people are willing to accept a male affiliate, a female affiliate back into their community. And when we describe now a more specific male or female former affiliate and say that this person is repentant, then again, this number goes way up, now all the way up to 87%. So what we're finding is that receptivity to return is really high, particularly when former affiliates are um, thought of as repentant. We've also found that receptivity seems to be going up over time, and this is going up as more and more former affiliates are actually returning to communities. So this data is from 2020, what I'm showing you now. Um, so, you know, not that long ago, we see that receptivity to return is pretty high. People are pretty willing to accept and forgive. We asked the same questions again in 2022. And here we find an even this big increase just over the last two years with the same questions um, in receptivity to return and willingness to forgive. So now over 80% of people are willing to accept or forgive a, a generic man or woman who had been with Boko Haram. And these pr levels look more similar to when we describe someone who's repentant, suggesting that maybe now that reintegration is happening much more frequently, people are giving the benefit of the doubt to a generic Boko Haram member thinking that they're repentant. We also wanted to know whether people who have been more victimized by Boko Haram are less receptive to return. What we found is somewhat surprisingly, there was generally no relationship between how much one's community or family was victimized and how receptive they are to returning Boko Haram affiliates. But having a family member who was abducted, knowing about an instance of sexual violence in one's community and personally being harmed are all related to being less receptive and less willing to forgive. And also higher levels of victimization are associated with more anger and fear. So more negative emotions towards Boko Haram affiliates. Finally, we wanted to know whether people in general wanna punish former Boko Haram members. And what we found is that desire for punishment is really low. So only about a quarter of people want <laughs> former Boko Haram affiliates to be punished. And this is the case whether the former affiliate is a man or a woman or an adult or a child. And when we ask this 25% of people who want to punish, what kind of punishments they want, we see things like prosecution, obligatory rehabilitation, imprisonment, and public apologies and renouncements. Almost nobody wants capital or physical punishments. So to just to summarize, what we find is that in general in Northeast Nigeria, people are very receptive to, in particular, repentant former Boko Haram affiliates returning to their community, and they don't have a strong desire to fund, to punish these former affiliates. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Fantastic. Uh, many thanks to, to Dr. Lippman for that, uh, I think, sometimes counterintuitive, but very positive message. And of course, we heard about some of this, uh, and Dr. Lippman uh, referred to it specifically here, the, the research in the MIAC project that supports this. I can say in my own previous research uh, for the World Bank and as a part of my doctoral work, I found similar uh, conclusions from the demobilization of armed groups across the Great Lakes region that, of course, uh, fear of return was very high initially, but very quickly, strikingly quickly, after a return uh, began, uh, community members were more and more likely uh, to describe ex-combatants as positive contributions to their community. Um, uh, and really, through this slow process of kind of building social cohesion, building relationships, building trust, uh, that this, uh, this occurs. I think this is so much of what social reintegration is all about. Uh, next, I'll hand over the floor to Fatima. Please, Fatima. Fantastic.
Good afternoon again. It's my pleasure to present to you about community receptivity and accountability preferences in the northeast of Nigeria. Uh, I will try to be quick here on this slide because you have seen it a few times now. Um, I want you to have a feel of the number of communities that we have worked in and surveyed. Um, we surveyed some of those communities over a period of years, which helps us better understand changing community perceptions in the Northeast. With many people exiting Boko Haram, we were curious to see how this was impacting community level perceptions and acceptance of those who are coming back. At the end of last year, we ran a survey that initially that we initially did at the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021, so that we could compare how things are looking two years later. The survey was done over the phone in different communities in Borno, Adamawa, and Yobe State. Um, Dr. Littman had already explained this, so I will skip that. The, the question that Dr. Littman highlight, highlighted are general and hypothetical. And to better understand actual receptivity, we asked respondents a more specific question about close relative who willingly joined or were abducted. We also asked if they knew people in their community who willingly joined or were abducted. Sorry about that. We then asked if they accepted them when they came back, and if they hadn't come back, we asked if they would accept them back. As you can see here, actual acceptance is higher compared to hypothetical acceptance. When people are confronted with those close to them, they are more likely to accept them back. The numbers are from two years ago, and even then you can see that the rate of acceptance is quite high. If we look at numbers from a few months ago, you can see that they have also gone up, especially the hypothetical numbers. For example, two years ago, 53% said they would hypothetically accept back people in their community who had willingly joined Boko Haram. Now this is 77%. So this gone up with more than 20%. We think that these high levels of receptivity are partly because those returns are not happening in a vacuum. People are indeed coming back and reintegrating, even while the conflict is still ongoing. And community members are engaging and accepting them, those, accepting them back. The res respondents know people, many respondents know who people come back and they have had positive stories about them. More people have had positive stories compared to those who had had negative stories. The orange bars on this slide represent our data from a survey at the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021. And the blue bars represent a survey we did only a few months ago. And this means that there are now even more positive stories and the number of negative stories has gone down. Many respondents have told us that if those exiting Boko Haram are being treated fairly, a lot, a lot more people will come out. And I think it is essential for the exits to be successful that those who come out are treated appropriately. Again, Dr. Littman has highlighted the impact of victimization, so I'm going to skip that one too. We asked people what they would like to happen to those who come out of Boko Haram, and the responses depend on how the question is asked. As Rebecca just explained, when you start by asking if someone who had been with Boko Haram should be punished, 
few people say yes. But if you skip that question and directly ask what punishment should someone who has who was with Boko Haram get, the number goes up significantly. We try to get a nuanced understanding of people's preferences when it comes to punishment. We ask people what they wanted to happen to men or women who came out of Boko Haram, as well as people who fought or killed and people who served in support roles. We did not read these options out loud. Instead, we chose the closest option from a list. As you can see, the preference for death sentence goes up when talking about people who fought for Boko Haram, for example. I would also like to add that people don't necessarily know that what associates do, did during their time with Boko Haram. We also asked if people approve of the government detaining those who come out of Boko Haram. As indicated here, most people do. However, you can see that when we say that these people are repentant, approval for detention goes down significantly. During focus group discussions, we did ask what repentance means to people, and the bar seems to be low. Just coming out of Boko Haram and not associating with them was regarded as being repentant. Lastly, I would also we also asked about what should happen to Boko Haram group as a whole. We read the answer options out loud in this question and people could pick multiple options. We noticed that a lot of people chose the other option, so we added an open-ended question to ask what else should happen. Most of these respondents said that Boko Haram should be forgiven. Some people say other things like the government should decide, but overall it's either nothing or they should be forgiven. I will end with a few uh, policy reflections. Acceptance is high in the Northeast at the moment. Of course, this could change over time but it does show that there is an opportunity for peace. Having said that, careful attention should be paid to the fact that some people might still face stigma. For women and girls who have children when they come out of Boko Haram, they might face even additional challenges as a result of that. Even, even though most people who were victimized indicated it was at the hands of Boko Haram, they also pointed to the military as well as other actors. To effectively address the legacies of violence during conflict, we need to approach we need some approaches that takes all of this into consideration. From a methodological perspective, it is important to note that different questions will lead to different answers. We have tried to address this by asking a range of varying questions in different surveys, but this is something to consider when we are interpreting these results. The question is, of course, why people are so accepting. This seems to be quite different from some other conflict setting because for me, I think what is happening here is many people are tired and fed up with the, conf with the way the conflict is going. And it has been going for so long. At this point, all they want is to have peace and normalcy return. Some say they are tired of how the military is approaching the situation they say that if accepting back former Boko Haram members will bring peace, they are willing to do so. Right now, receptivity is going better than expected, but I believe there's a lot to be addressed. It looks like the state government is not ready to handle such large numbers that are coming out, and it seems they are not prepared in terms of accommodation and basic necessities like food and health care. I would like to end it right here. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Fatima. I think your, your presentation dovetailed, of course, perfectly with Dr. Lippmann's presentation. But I think you brought uh, an additional level of analytical clarity and precision here uh, with the figures uh, you presented. And I, I really appreciate also at the end there how you highlighted especially some of the special at-risk groups that may exist, even in light of this 
general picture of, uh, of, of uh, positive rep receptivity to return. Now, so far uh, with, with your presentation, Fatima, and with Dr. Lippman before, we've focused on uh, the Lake Chad Basin here, but I want to turn now uh, to um, Tamara uh, to have the opportunity to look also at Iraq. Uh, so, uh, okay, fantastic. Hi. Thanks, everyone. I, I'm uh, Mara Revkin, an associate professor of law at Duke University. Uh, it's really great to be here. And um, also, just as an ex academic, really exciting to hear so much support from so many different UN agencies um, and donors for, for data collection and research to support evidence-based policymaking. So I really welcome that kind of academic um, uh, sort of practice uh, collaboration and, and hope um, we'll have a lot more of it. So um, I, uh, some of you who were here yesterday already saw some of the, the, um, the findings I'm going to present. And every Everyone's comments just um, throughout the day have been so interesting that I'm going to improvise a little bit and just react to a few things that were said, pulling out a couple of findings in the slide. But first, um, so since uh, the theme of this, this panel is, is the role of justice in, in um, uh, reintegration, um, I wanted to just uh, to, to second and, and um, reiterate uh, or, or strongly agree with um, Ulrich's point about the promise of transitional justice as a framework for, um, for supporting uh, uh, reintegration um, of, uh, in, in post conflict settings, and one that I think is broader and, and allows um, for a more expansive range of tools than counterterrorism frameworks and their related sort of soft counterterrorism um, frameworks of CBE and PBE. I think um, I have an article um, coming out um, soon about what I call sort of the mission creep of counterterrorism into peace building, which is where, um, as a result of U, uh, UN Security Council re uh, resolutions and um, other uh, sort of post-9-11 frameworks, we've seen more and more uh, humanitarian and, and development agencies engaging in work that really is was not traditionally within in their mandates. And um, just to say that sort of transitional, and just as an example of this, um, you know, agencies um, that focus on education, like UNESCO, may be doing CBE or PBE programming in schools. Um, and transitional justice also provides uh, a, a framework for support for, for education, but one that doesn't require um, a, a counterterrorism lens. Um, so you, know, can, you can think of the importance of education in transitional justice contexts for um, educating uh, people about past atrocities as a safeguard or bulwark against, um, uh, against uh, sort of the, the repetition or recurrence of, of these kinds of um, atrocities again. So um, just to, to really strongly agree that I think I would like to see um, I, you know, I, transitional Justice may have its problems too, but I think um, it may be time for some sort of a paradigm shift away from counterterrorism and to towards um, uh, more of a transitional justice framework. Um, I also have a self-interest in saying that because I teach transitional justice at, at law, law students. So um, just um, continuing um, on now with a couple of findings here that I will, um, I just want to pull out. So we've talked uh, already, I've covered these points, but um, some, some findings on the, uh, or sort of the, the importance of community perceptions of returnees. This is both from uh, research I've conducted with UNDP uh, and also the results of the MIAC survey in um, Iraq, which use some of the same questions and are broadly consistent. So um, I want to just um, point out here that, um, so in addition to, um, uh, the, the reason, all the reasons here for why um, uh, it's, it's important to get communities on board or, or supportive of, of, of reintegration. Um, I think this is, this is very much connected to, um, to justice and, and um, it's, it's important that communities um, feel um, that um, uh, communities particularly that have been victimized by um, uh, ISIL or other armed groups or other perpetrators um, feel that grievances have been um, redressed as a, as a condition um, for um, allowing the return of people associated with perpetrators. Traders. I would also say here that another really helpful um, principle of transitional justice is um, accountability for all perpetrators um, in a conflict, uh, not exclusively for perpetrators um, associated with terrorist groups, um, but a big problem that we have in Iraq is what we might call sort of one-sided or selective justice and accountability for um, uh, perpetrators of terrorism-related crimes um, while ignoring, um, in some cases, some equally uh, serious human rights violations by state security actors and their, their um, affiliated militias. So, 
Um, just uh, a couple more um, finding some data here. So um, uh, yeah, and so on the improvement, a few people have now noted um, in other contexts Im improvements in the community's um, sort of level of comfort with returnees. And I think um, in the Iraq context, we also saw this at least um, on retrospective questions asking respondents um, in, in these four communities in Iraq um, if they felt that the community had be become more comfortable with returns over time. Um, and around, um, so 40% of people said yes. Um, uh, so that's not a majority. Um, but I think to the extent that people are becoming more comfortable I would agree with others who have suggested that this is part of sort of an informational feedback loop where as more returns occur without too many adverse security incidents, people are reassured um, about the safety of the returns process. And I also think, um, and I think it was Dr. Uh, Lippmann um, and others have also mentioned, so as returnees begin to sort of contribute um, uh, productively to society and are, um, and are actually um, you know, playing a positive role in their communities, this also encourages return. Um, a little bit on, um, I'm going to skip this on, on accountability. Um, so um, asking specifically about necessary con conditions for return and um, what conditions communities want in place. Um, so this is where justice mechanisms become really important. Um, and we see some similarities but also differences between our findings here um, and in some of the other studies that we've talked about. I do just want to highlight that there is very strong support um, for just the general concept of psychological rehabilitation on our survey, even though, um, uh, although that concept is widely, the, the term in, in Arabic is widely uh, known. Um, in Iraq, um, there's there's some um, uh, I think confusion about what it actually means, and the international community often is um, using this to refer to de-radicalization. When communities um, often um, may think of rehabilitation really differently in terms of just sort of returning to ordinary um, uh, activities of life. Um, so, as an example of this, so um, Bridget earlier um, mentioned um, sort of the the absence of protective factors as as um, just as big of a problem as sort of the presence of um, problems problematic factors that are um, uh, dangerous to children. And so um, the, something like the absence of um, many of the children uh, who have displaced um, to a whole camp in Syria haven't had any education um, at all in their lives. And so it might just simply be the absence of education that is a risk factor here and not the need for some specialized de-radicalization program. But um, we've seen, and I visited the Jeddah One camp in, in Iraq where these um, children are returning from Syria, um, and they're incredibly excited to be enrolling in school again for the first time. And so I think in a lot of cases, is what, and, and again, this is where maybe transitional justice frameworks can be um, helpful. Uh, what we need is not so much sort of de-radicalization or the undoing of some kind of ideology, but sort of strengthening the capacity of, of basic services like education and healthcare um, as, as part of sort of overall um, you know, improvements in, in good governance and rule of law. And that is not sort of a, yeah, that, that is not something that we need counterterrorism tools to achieve. Um, I will also just um, note here that I just want to note the, the, the absence of, of extremely sort of harsh and punitive preferences. So very few, only a tiny percentage of respondents believe that in hypothetical scenarios of um, women and children and young men who have family ties to the Islamic State but aren't themselves perpetrators, um, very few want them to go to prison. Uh, just a methodological point here, um, and, and this was really interesting um, mentioned earlier on the panel, that when we ask about really abstract concepts like punishment, do you want someone to be punished? people often don't really know what to say to that because we're not um, specifying what type of punishment. And so this is where I think being really specific about, you know, are we talking about a long uh, prison sentence of um, five years or life or a shorter prison sentence? Um, and it, 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 we didn't ask here, but if we are asking about compensation, are we talking about how much money are we talking about? Um, I think it's important to be really specific in how we, how we ask these questions. And just as another methodological point, I think, um, and this is something that MIAC has, has really um, done well and very innovatively is to um, ask open-ended purely open-ended questions for respondents um, to really elicit um, just sort of free-form, unstructured yeah, responses um, and to, for them to sort of express um, in their own words um, without sort of needing to filter their responses through the categories that we may be imposing on them with our, our questionnaires. So those are just a, a, couple, a few reflections on justice. Went pretty off script there, but, um, but I'm looking forward to the, the discussion and um, I'll stop there. Off script or not, Dr. Revkin, I think that was a fantastic intervention. And for me, this is where things start to get really interesting when we start comparing between different contexts, because I really think this is where some of the analytical precision, clarity, and that hard shoe leather work of, of, uh, of, of uh, making more precise our concepts uh, and approaches really happens when we start to get into comparison and can distill what's really important. Uh, I also like the use of the term uh, soft counterterrorism. I don't think I've heard that before, but I'm going to adopt it. I'll cite you, don't worry. Uh, and 
uh, an overall uh, an engagement with, uh, with the potential promises of transitional justice, which I think is a perfect uh, transition uh, to Mr. Peter Knupa, so who's going to pick up on uh, a number of these themes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rindel. Um, the advantage of being last is that everybody has already said everything. Um, paradigm shift. Thank you, Mara. That's exactly what I was going to say. I come from a, a counterterrorism background, <laughs> which is important in this respect. Um, and I think in that counterterrorism frame, the paradigm shift is exactly what is needed. So I'll talk about that. I think what we should do is we should go from DDR to reconciliation. Thank you for hosting us in the Nelson Mandela room. I think it's appropriate. It's exactly where we should be. Um, DDR in a counterterrorism frame is PVE. It's part of PVE. It's what they call, what we call, tertiary prevention, meaning we want to prevent people from recidivism. We don't want them to go back because that is a security risk. If they go back, it's a security risk, so we don't want them to go back. So it's prevention, it's PVE. Now, what is important is that PVE, from since 2011, since Obama introduced PVE, is owned by governments. It's a government's trip. The Global Counterterrorism Forum, governments. CVE, PVE strategies, governments. It's a government owned agenda. And that is important in understanding where things went wrong. The DDR, disengagement, um, Shoban, you, you showed us this morning the, the road. You know where that comes from? Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia introduced that, that, how do you say that, frame, that recipe, some 20 years ago. The Naif Center, I've been there several times. What they did is they said, okay, we've got some of our brothers that went the wrong way. So what we do, we bring them in the Naif Center in Saudi Arabia, you should go there, it's interesting and they treat them as brothers. Okay, we disengage you, we take you out of that frame, and then we start to work on your brain. de radically we change your mind. We change your behavior. Somebody was mentioning it this morning or this afternoon. We change your behavior, and then we change your mind, and then you go back. Today we call it reintegration. That's not what the Saudis said. The Saudis just said, you go back. That model, the Saudi model, the naive center model, was copied by the Indonesians, then the Singaporeans, and then it traveled into Europe. So it became fashionable. It's a fashionable model, and then Hidea Center, embraced it, the Global Counterterrorism Forum embraced it, the RAN, the Radicalization Awareness Network, embraced it, and it became the global model. We used it. We didn't talk about the victims. We never talked about the victims in the PVE, CVE framework. We just brought these people back. Now, the people in Europe don't want them back. The British don't want them back. The um, French, oh, three, oh my God, I need to speed up, I'm sorry. Nobody wants them back, people resist. Now, the good news is that in Nigeria, apparently that's different. There's a couple of underlying assumptions in that system, and I'll go very, very quickly now. That's a pity now. First of all, the underlying assumption is that terrorism is a problem of the individual. You need to talk to the individual, then it will be solved. Secondly, 
Reintegration is economic. You give a person a job, you do some counseling, done. You change the mind, done. There's no further analysis or fixing of the underlying root causes. We simply forget about that. And it's understood as a conflict between the individual and the community. Okay, maybe, maybe that's what it is, but maybe not, Akinolo. I think you know better than that. Is it a conflict between Boko Haram and the communities? Or is it a conflict between the government and the, com uh, and the services, the security services, and Boko Haram? Is it a conflict between the government and the auto defense organizations? On a political level, it certainly is. Maybe the conflict is very different. Maybe it isn't between the individual and the community. Maybe it's something else. The actor that we left out of the equation is the state. Okay, we frame it as a problem between the individual and the community. Perfect. So the state, where's the state in all of this? Remember, PVE, CVE is state-owned. It's state-driven. So we leave the state out of the equation. Now, the social contract was mentioned several times today. Westphalia, 1648, remember, I pay tax, I get security. That's the ID. Is that the case in uh, Nigeria? Is that the case in Iraq? Is that the case in Cameroon? I pay taxes, then I... We could have two days conference, Shoban, on taxes and security. <laughs> Very interesting. But it's not according to the Westphalian model. What happens in Nigeria, in Nigeria or Cameroon or Chad is nowhere near the Westphalian model. So something else needs to happen. Nelson Mandela, we're in his room, TRC. Now remember, TRC is truth and reconciliation. Reconciliation is the outcome, it's not the process. Reconciliation is the result of the process. Yes, one minute. <laughs> the process is the T. Nelson Mandela has been misinterpreted, interpre and I'm not, it's not my native language, is misconceptualized many times. Truth and reconciliation is not about reconciliation, it's about truth. If you want truth, you need investigations, you need facts. You need to understand and know what happens. So the question is, in the Lake Chad region, how do we define the conflict? How is that conflict defined? What is it? What is happening? And then if we want to get the investigations and the facts, who's going to do the research? Who is it, the government? Is it the government, the PVE owners, that do the research, the fact-finding? Or is it so somebody else? Who's the Desmond Tutu in the Lake Chad region? Do you have a Desmond Tutu? Do you have a Nelson Mandela there? Or is it the government of Nigeria? Who is the owner of the process? Or is it again integrated into the PVE, CVE agenda. Who's at the head of the table? And who else is invited to that table? Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Peter, for some uh, provocative comments there. I really appreciate uh, tracing the the, the arc of conceptual developments from the CT perspective and your experience there, and especially your emphasis on truth and re reconciliation uh, uh, with a focus on, on the truth part. And I think that ties so well uh, to Ulrich's opening comments about uh, the legal frameworks focused on specific acts as well, uh, that there has to be information. Um, um, now, you know, in light of this, uh, this really illuminating discussion but from our different panelists, I'm going to hand over the floor to Akinola to be our discussant and maybe try to, to round things off. Uh, so please.
All right, thanks very much, um, Randolph. Um, very fascinating panel, very dynamic. Um, I think I'd like to appreciate the contributions of every panelist. They raised quite a number of points. I think it's quite difficult to unpack everything within a short um, time frame. So what I'm going to do is to focus on one central theme, which I perceive is inherent in most of the presentations. Now, what is the relationship between dialogue, community receptivity, accountability, and justice? And the operational word here is dialogue. Because I think even in the previous panel, there was some reference, maybe not explicitly uh, made, but to the idea of dialogue. When we talk about bringing people to the table, when we talk about um, the outcome being reconciliation, how do you get to that stage? And I think dialogue really comes out, and I think it's important that before we respond to this um, question of what is the connection or the linkage between dialogue, community receptivity, accountability, and justice, we need to perhaps have a sense of what dialogue is. And I know it can be the subject of um, a lot of debates, but then I think at its very basis, um, dialogue is really about an exchange of ideas, what we're doing today actually. An exchange of opinions, a conversation involving stakeholders or parties to an issue, um, which may not necessarily lead to uh, the making of concessions. Um, if you probe it further, Dialogue also entails an attempt to create a sense of connection among a diversity of actors. Um, if you take it even further, dialogue may also mean an attempt to identify um, perhaps areas where we can have more inclusivity of very important voices, voices of women, for instance, in communities, whether it's in Iraq, whether it's in uh, the Lake Chad Basin countries. Um, the deconstruction of stereotypes, the fostering of, of uh, you know, some kind of understanding of what connects everything together. And maybe perhaps the identification of leadership and capacity within communities that can drive a process within those same communities. Now, um, when we speak about a process, the idea of reintegration comes you know, easily to mind. And we've made reference to this in various you know, panel conversations. Um, reintegration or the process of reintegration is closely associated with this idea of community receptivity in communities. But for there to be successful uh, reintegration in those communities or for there to be effective um, community reception or receptivity, um, there needs to be some form of you know, exchange of ideas, dialogue in other words. You know, it's a two-way street. Shoban made reference to this yesterday. And I think it's also important that we, we think of this in terms of um, the idea of understanding how communities actually, you know, view dialogue. It's also very key. And not just external, externally adapting our own concept of dialogue. Um, when we, we take, for instance, um, I think Ulrich mentioned something about traditional forms of justice. Um, it's a very important aspect of this conversation because really it's about recognizing those, um, those justice or accountability mechanisms that are valid in the eyes of communities, you know, that are located in the contextual realities of those communities, not something we just adapt from outside. So I think when we think about even transitional justice, accountability, all these concepts we use so freely here, it's really about understanding how communities view these concepts and apply them in their own reality. Um, I'd like to sort of wrap up. I, I think there's a lot to discuss during the workshop. Um, the panelists have already raised a number of ideas, but I'd like to leave us with a few questions. Um, one, how do we apply dialogue um, in complex environments, Iraq, Nigeria, and so on? At what level do we ex ex engage stakeholders? Um, who are we even engaging? Is it dialogue involving communities within communities or between communities? Is it dialogue involving communities and the justice sector? Dialogue involving communities and the security actors? Is it dialogue involving the states, the governments, you know, and pot maybe potentially violent extremist groups? Um, the second question is, can dialogue be understood in terms of a continuum or part of a continuum? 
Can we even journey further beyond dialogue to the point of negotiation and perhaps even more? Maybe this is something to think about. And then finally, how can dialogue help us to achieve the objective of successful or effective community receptivity, um, accountability? Can dialogue play a role here? And how do we um, leverage existing platforms of dialogues within communities? Because we can assume that there's nothing in communities, but the platforms actually exist. So how do we leverage these platforms? How would we engage those communities in trying to scale capacity and actually achieve the outcome of successful um, community receptivity, accountability, and justice? So I'll leave it here, and I think um, we'll have the chance to discuss in the workshop. Thank you. Akinola, thank you so much. I think that was a fantastic summary of the discussion, really emphasizing that every panelist here put forward the idea that justice, accountability are important issues for community receptivity, reintegration, return, um, and that there must be some form of justice process. Uh, what that is, you know, perhaps should remain elastic, pragmatic, but of course with clear limits. Um, and that I think what you put so well here, of course, is that we should remain humble in our approach uh, to these things uh, as, as outsiders. So I'll stop there. I think now we break into the specific uh, workshop sessions, and I'll hand the microphone to, to Siobhan.